You have chosen the most fascinating and fabulous program. You've chosen 1909, and you've chosen three composers writing works in that year, uh, Mahler, Strauss, and Schoenberg, all of whom knew one another, all of whom were friends and, mm -hmm. and colleagues, and all of whom were going in different directions, although in one way they were all going in the same direction at, at one point which I'll, I'll come on to in just a second, if I may. You've chosen Rosencavalier in a suite of your own devising, which I'm, I'm fascinated to, uh, to learn more about. And you've chosen Rosencavalier, uh, obviously for that year, 1909, but also that Strauss was, in a way, going backwards. He'd, he'd written yes. Salome, he'd written Electra. He was starting to share the atmosphere that Schoenberg uh, experienced and writes about in the orchestral works that we're going to hear in this program. And then you have Mahler in the 10th Symphony in that first movement, which I will take to my desert island maybe more than even the 9th Symphony, which I adore also experiencing that planet th that I think that, that Schoenberg was, was, was looking at. The, a, a planet which was new, uh, that was a planet of immense striving, a planet that was pushing tonality in a very, very new direction. And I, I cannot think of that first movement, the, the Adagio, without thinking about that incredible chord and that screaming trumpet, as if he had set Munch's scream to music. That's, that's how it always appears to me. And it, it feels as if he is about to go in a new direction. He dies two years later, but it, it feels as if this is the start of a new beginning for him as well. I've thrown a lot of ideas at you there, but I'd, I'd love for you to, to drill into that and to give us your thinking about this program. Well, I thought it was interesting that we began this festival back in September 20 years earlier, in 1889, when mm -hmm. Strauss had just blazed onto the scene with Don Juan, and Mahler had uh, produced the early version of what became the first symphony as we know it. And what happened to them in those intervening 20 years is really so fascinating because Mahler wrote these uh, 10 extraordinary symphonies, if you count Das Lied von der Erde, plus mm -hmm. the nine numbered symphonies, which just encompass the whole range of human emotion and the whole range of human experience and his growth as a composer during those 20 years, I think is so extraordinary, which makes the 10th all the more poignant because all we can do is speculate mm -hmm. about what would have happened had he lived past the uh, tragically young age of 50. How would he have reacted to what Schoenberg did? Uh, it, it just falls into the realm of speculation. So the Adagio of the 10th, I think, becomes almost the epitaph to his epitaph because one, I guess in one sense, he couldn't have followed the Ninth Symphony with anything, really. But mm -hmm. of course he did, because he was a great creative artist who needed to uh, continue his growth. So um, I think we hear the Tenth very differently, juxtaposed, first of all, with the work of his great contemporary Strauss. By the time we get to 1909, as you say, uh, Strauss was finished with the tone poems, finished with mm -hmm. Don Juan and Don Quixote and Till Eulenspiegel and Zarathustra and Helden Leben and all the pieces like that. He was mostly interested in opera, and in Salome and Electra, he went towards the precipice of the end of traditional harmony. And as you very rightfully say, I think he got scared. And that, to take that next step, well, what, what was is, more than he could do. What, you, you, that's a big word to you, scared. Scared of what? Scared of, of his reputation as a composer? Scared of, of being a revolutionary? Scared of not having commercial success? What, how would you define it? I think that after he got his days as an enfant terrible over with mm -hmm. in, in his 20s, he was actually a profoundly conservative man and a very conservative uh, composer. And there was something about the past 
that had been transmitted to him from his father, who was a really conservative man. You know, his father detested Wagner. And Strauss sort of had to study a score like Tristan on the sly, on the side, so his father wouldn't know. But I think there was this sort of innate, if I may say so, Bavarian uh, conservatism about him. And there was a point past which he was not going to go. And he couldn't picture composing for decades more in the same language as Salome and Electra. And he very consciously took a step back. The result, of course, being Rosencavalier, a piece which everybody knows and loves, and which he saw as kind of his Mozart opera, but uh, with a huge orchestra. With a huge orchestra. <laughs> but, you know, he lived for another 40 years. Yes. And I think that with the exception of a piece like, say, the Metamorphosen for 23 solo mm -hmm. strings, which he wrote right at the end of his life, he was basically recomposing Rosenkevler mm -hmm. uh, for the next 40 years. And the result was mm -hmm. some terrific pieces, Die Frau on a Shot and uh, the mm -hmm. Oboe Concerto, the Second Horn Concerto, and also some pieces which perhaps don't stand up quite as well. Uh, to the earlier pieces. So that's yeah. sort of how I see uh, Strauss's role in this whole thing. The way that you describe Strauss, though, in a way, I would apply to Mahler as well. Not necessarily the music, but the man. I mean, the man, from everything that I've read about him, everything I've learned about him, was profoundly conservative, in the sense that he was profoundly 19th century. I, I never think of him as being a 20th century composer. He's like um, Elgar or, or Rachmaninoff in a way. He sort of finds his way into the 20th century rather than being in the 20th century. I agree with you. I think that, that's, a, that's a great way of looking at it. Mahler is a composer who's full of contradictions. I mean, there's, there's contradictions all over the place in the music, and we've heard that all this semester. What's so interesting to me about Mahler is how he became the important composer of our time in the years after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And it's as though he anticipated the kind of world that we were going to have. You know, he's one of these composers where although he really only wrote about 15 or 16 hours worth of music, I personally don't feel, as, as someone who loves his music, that he left very much unsaid in these That's symphonies and in, in these songs. Um, it's as though, uh, I, I remember what Glenn Gould said about Strauss, he was of his time by being of none. Mm -hmm. And there's this timeless quality to Mahler. What I think draws the three composers on this program together is sort of the unspoken historical fact of what was coming. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at 1909, 1910, 1911, the year of Mahler's death. In 1914, uh, the world that Mahler and Strauss and Schoenberg knew was destroyed. Was destroyed. I mean, began to fall apart mm -hmm. and finally fell apart for good in 1945. Mm -hmm. And one can hear in these late pieces of Mahler, if one chooses to, maybe he knew, maybe he sensed that in some way his okay, world was I, going. I, 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 intuitively and emotionally, I want to go with you, but I'm going to place devil's advocate and say, is that not our projection upon hearing his music and then applying it to our time? In 1914, the world, the world was destroyed. And then in 1939, it committed suicide. At least Europe committed suicide. Yes. And it's very interesting to place Mahler's music in that context and say, well, it, he was prescient. He, he knew. He, the sounds that he created were the sounds that describe our emotions and describe the world that we then created. But it is, is that us rather than him? It is us rather than him, but I think it speaks to the power and the strength of the music that... It can evoke that. Um, I, I, there are so many composers who lived at that time who you would not sense that at all in their music. Rachmaninoff, when you mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's Tchaikovsky with a slightly more modern mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, harmonic language, and that's no insult to, mm -hmm. to uh, music, which many people enjoy, which I love to perform, which we all love to hear. Um, I think it says something about the depth of Mahler's emotional life and the depth of his intellect that his symphonies do contain the whole world, as he said to Sibelius, that that's what a symphony should do, and it does. And that includes things in the world that perhaps to Mahler himself, um, he didn't realize that it was going to manifest itself in the way that it did mm -hmm. in European history in the first half of the 20th century. But mm -hmm. looking back on it, yes, maybe we do project that on the music. And I think we probably do that with a lot of music of the past. That's why it yeah. continues to speak to us. Yeah. Let's just talk about the, the Schoenberg orchestral pieces. One of the 20th century's great masterpieces, also one of the most challenging works that anyone can, can possibly uh, program, I, I believe. It's there, any orchestral musician, even the most experienced in whatever orchestra, will see that uh, on the roster and think, whoa, okay, I've got to be really prepared for this one. How are you going about introducing this to, to the kids in the orchestra? I've been really pleased by how seriously the students have been taking to this piece because I'm sure that for most of them it's the first Schoenberg they've ever played. And uh, it's a very different language. It's a language which remains uh, challenging uh, for listeners. It's certainly challenging for performers. Um, it's funny that when you start to take these atonal chords apart, I mean, uh, Schoenberg actually preferred the term non-tonal, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit less judgmental. But you see that there are usually four note chords, three of which are very consonant. <laughs> and then there's the one dissonance added in. Um, the, the point I've been trying to make to them in rehearsal is that we really have to remember that Schoenberg saw himself as the continuation of the great German tradition from mm -hmm. Mozart and Haydn yes. and Beethoven through mm -hmm. Mahler and Strauss. And um, I, at this point, wish I had a nickel for every time I've said in a rehearsal, let's make this sound like Brahms. With the same cantabile yes. feeling, with the same feeling of melody. It's just that the harmonic language is so different. Uh, a composer friend of mine once said um, that the trouble with chromaticism is that it's a pressure cooker. Something's always mm -hmm. rubbing against something else. And it becomes difficult in that music to um, express serenity or joie de vivre or a kind of calm happiness. And in, in the five pieces, except perhaps in the third movement, there's something always underneath. There's something agitated. And the challenge is to try to express the full, broad range of the music's uh, emotional life within this pungent uh, sort of language. So it's, it's been a real challenge for them and a, and a real challenge for me. But I think when we hear these three pieces um, together, mm -hmm. we'll realize what a fascinating time this was at the end of Mahler's life, at the end of this first decade of the 20th century. I've always thought that if I could get in a time machine mm -hmm. and go anywhere, I would want to be in Berlin, Vienna, in Paris in the years between around 1895, 1900, okay. uh, to the beginning of the okay. First World War. And then I'd like mm -hmm. to get out yep. Yep. and come back to the United yep. States. But if you think about what was, what was going on in in Schoenberg's life in Berlin and Vienna, and Mahler in Vienna, uh, Strauss in Berlin, and everything in Paris, with Debussy, Ravel starting out and um, obviously culminating in, in Stravinsky and in the three great ballets. Um, what a time of um, uh, intellectual and artistic ferment this was. And um, we now know, of course, the tragedy that that followed, and what would life have been like mm. had that not happened? Yeah, I was t chatting with um, uh, some of the, the kids about the Schoenberg, and I, I just asked for some impressions, and two of them said, "Oh, we we don't understand it at all. This is we're just playing the notes," and two others who were sitting with them 
absolutely took umbrage at this and and argued back saying can't you hear can't you hear what this sound is you're not just playing notes this you have to play it with passion you have to play it just as if you were playing Mahler or or Brahms so you you've obviously established this um uh, this dialectic in the orchestra of giving them a, a new experience, which I, th I think will take them to a very different place after they've performed it. And the really interesting thing, we won't really see until the concert, which is what does the Strauss feel like after we've heard um, the Schoenberg, which he was composing in 1909. Yes. And then with this irony that Rosenkavalier had its first performance uh, just a couple of months before Mahler died. Mm -hmm. And so it was a piece that Mahler never knew. Mm -hmm. And as the great opera conductor of his time, what kind of Rosenkavalier would, Strat would Mahler have <laughs> conducted? Would he even have liked the piece? Mm -hmm. There are so many questions that the juxtaposition of these pieces brings up that I, so, I hope it will be food for thought for the students and no, for the audience sure long so. after this is over. So uh, tell me about your version of the Rosenkavalier suite. I mean, you've put it together and you, you've made some changes. So tell us about those changes. Yeah. Strauss shared with Stravinsky the fact that in addition to being a great composer, he was a really shrewd businessman. Mm -hmm. And he was not above milking his works for every penny he could get out of them. Rosen Cavalier was an instant success from the first performance in 1911, and Strauss immediately saw its commercial potential. Not just in the sense that every opera house in Germany wanted to perform it, and also abroad, but uh, somebody made a silent film of the story, which Strauss uh, put together sort of a, 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 yeah. a little theater orchestra version of some of the music mm -hmm. that could be played simultaneously with the silent film. He made a piano roll, which I've been trying to find, yeah. of uh, some of the waltz music from Rosen Cavalier. <laughs> um, later on, he sanctioned um, a couple of other uh, arrangers to make sort of these potpourri mm -hmm. um, arrangements of the big tunes. Mm -hmm. um, later on, there was a, a second waltz arrangement which he himself allegedly made. And then there's this suite, which was not made until 1945, and uh, four years before Strauss's death. And you can easily picture him thinking, well, how can I get a little more money out of Rosenkavalier? Mm -hmm. As far as we know, the suite was put together by the conductor Arthur Rodzinski, a fine musician. Mm -hmm. Um, and it includes, you know, a lot of the big moments that everybody knows, the prelude, uh, the uh, the presentation scene, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of the, the big waltz, of course, that vulgar tune, mm -hmm. and um, a little bit of the final trio. But what just enraged me the first time I heard it was that this trio, which is one of the most wonderful moments Absolutely. in any opera, yeah. gets interrupted after about a minute by a snare drum roll, which then leads into this disgusting, vulgar reprise of the big waltz tune. Mm. And that really always bothered me. So when the time came that I could perform this music, I first had to say to myself, "What can is, is there a way out of this? And I found that if one simply made a little cut into the actual score of the opera, of that beautiful final trio, and then the very ending of the opera, which mm -hmm. is like nothing, you know, that any other composer could have thought of, mm -hmm. that pretty much all the vocal parts were there. And all one needed to do was to put a few lines into a few wind instruments and play with the dynamics a little bit, mm -hmm. and the orchestra is playing all of the vocal music. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was just a much better way for an orchestra to present music from Rosenkavalier. Of course, there's no orchestral version that can possibly be as good as seeing the piece staged. Mm -hmm. But we have to face reality that in our country, at least, there are only maybe two or three opera companies that could really stage Rosenkavalier with any kind of, of mm -hmm. quality, with enough rehearsal time, with a really great orchestra, with a great conductor, with a proper cast. And I think our orchestras should be able to play this music, and our students should be able to learn it, and our audiences should be able to hear it, played by our terrific American orchestras, um, without that horrible vulgar ending. So I'm hoping that my very modest uh, attempt at making a, what I like to think is maybe a more appropriate orchestral arrangement will be a way for audiences to maybe get to know the orchestral music a little better, and one hopes, uh, investigate the opera.